Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Jacob and in this video we are going to be talking about smart contract storage locations in Ethereum versus Near. So first let me just clarify what storage locations are. When we are writing a smart contract, usually we're dealing with data and that data needs to live somewhere. So we're going to be talking about the different places where data can live in Ethereum. So like when you're writing a smart contract in Solidity, versus near, which is a different blockchain. So um, my goals for this video are to clarify the difference between storage, memory, and call data in Solidity, and then demonstrate an alternative in near. All right, so first up, what is storage? What is memory? So storage is kind of like the permanent place where we're going to be storing data. When you think of writing something to the blockchain so that it's permanent, it's this indelible record that nobody can ever erase, right? That's what storage is. You could compare it to, so if we're going to say that our smart contract is like an application that's running on your computer, then storage is like writing a file, right? It's like saving a file. So you're saving a data file. It's maybe like a Photoshop image or a text document or something like that. Storage is that permanent place where we put data. So after we close our application, and in this metaphor, it's our smart contract stops running, the files are still going to be there for next time when you open that application or run that smart contract again. Whereas memory, on the other hand, that's more evanescent. It's a little more volatile because it's like when you create a variable in your program, you say x equals 150. And then you run your program, maybe you print out x, it says 150. And then your program ends. And then when you run your program again, x isn't still 150, you have to create x and calculate 150 or whatever all over again, because it was erased, it was forgotten. So that's kind of like what memory is for smart contracts. You can create these temporary values, they're stored in memory, and then when the transaction or your smart contract stops running, when the transaction ends, those values are forgotten. Also, there is technically a third place that we can store data in the EVM. It's called the stack, but that is handled by the compiler. So unless you are writing assembly for the EVM, you never have to worry about the stack. And for the most part, actually, storage and memory are handled by the compiler as well. You only need to worry about storage and memory if you are dealing with what are called complex data types, which is pretty much a dynamic array or a struct. And then we have call data. So we have storage, memory, and call data. And call data is kind of like a special case of memory. Um, and it's only used in function parameters. It's like an immutable reference to someone else's data. So I'm just reading my slide. Uh, but yeah, so, so you can say that your function parameter is stored in call data, and that gives you a little bit of an advantage in terms of gas. It doesn't use as much gas, but the disadvantage is, of course, you can't uh, modify it. If it's stored in call data, that's like someone else's memory, and you can only read from it. You're only allowed to read a small bit from this call data memory, and you can't modify it. So there are some restrictions with call data, but it also uses up a little bit less gas. All right, so that's enough of the slides. Let's jump into the code. I have this example code here on Remix, and I will have a link to this code as a GitHub gest as, and also a uh, link to the Remix thing. It'll like load in the code automatically from the gest, so that's pretty convenient. So you can follow along right with me. So just check the description, and pull up this code and we can follow and you can follow along. We can do this together. So let's take a look at this Solidity smart contract here really quick. Um, first off, we're defining this struct. It's a really simple struct that I've called complex struct for reasons of irony. Uh, but no, it's because it's a complex data type uh, because it's a user defined struct. And it just contains these two values here. They're both unsigned 256 bit integers, X and Y. So it's like a point, right? X and Y. Um, and then here, this is the first place where we are going to encounter storage locations in our contract here. That's because all member variables, and this, my value right here, this is a member variable of the storage test contract. All member variables by default are stored in storage. Now it's it's not stated here. We're not saying like, oh, this is a complex struct storage or anything like that. Um, we don't have to say that. 
because all of the member variables here are they're in storage by default because when you save something to like a member variable when you write to the member variable you want it to be there later so these are always in storage by default and that actually means that this storage keyword that we see right here doesn't get used all that often you know there are a couple use cases for it but it's not very common to use this storage keyword. I think more often you'll be seeing memory and call data. So there are more examples for those below. But let's walk through really quick um, this little storage by ref or value test function right here and see how storage works. So here we have this local variable called another struct. That is a complex struct that we are storing in storage. Then we set it equal to my value, which is this um, member variable here. So we have this member variable and this local variable. And we're setting the local variable equal to the member variable. And then we're saying this local variable's y field is going to increment or increase by 100. So let's come over here. I'm just going to enable autocompile here. Um, and then, right, so we're here and I'm going to say deploy. See what this contract looks like. And here we have a whole bunch of different functions we can call. The one we want is right here, storage by ref or value test. So, well, actually, let's take a look at my value right uh, first. It's 0, 0, x is 0, y is 0. Then we'll say storage by ref or value. Click on my value, see what it is equal to. It's 0 and 100. So what that tells you is that this right here, we're not copying my value over to another struct. We are just, it's just a reference. So another struct and my value end up pointing to the same bit of data. And that's an important point because you might be thinking, why can't we just create a new struct and put it inside of another struct? Like this line of code right here. I had it commented out because the compiler will get mad at me if I do this. But you'll see what we're doing right here is we're saying another struct is equal to, and then we're creating this struct. We're creating a new struct. Uh, here, and the compiler gets mad at us. So let's see what the compiler has to say. We'll read this error here. It says type error, type struct uh, in memory, type struct that's stored in memory is not implicitly, convert, implicitly convertible to the expected type of a struct stored in, uh, stored in storage, or it's a pointer to a struct that's stored in storage. So it's a little bit confusing the way that they ordered the words here. But essentially, what this means is this little bit of data right here, this struct is existing. It floats around in memory. That's what it's saying here. It's a struct that's in memory. But what this bit right here is expecting is a pointer to a struct that is stored in storage. So this actually fails on two points. It doesn't fit in here for two reasons. One, it's stored in memory, not in storage. And two, it's not a pointer. So that actually is a really interesting piece of information. Good to remember that um, these data types that are in storage are actually pointers. So we'll just uh, comment this back out and put this back so that it will compile again. Everything's happy. So that should cover the storage keyword for now. Um, then we have this reset function that we'll use now when we have set struct. We have uh, four different set struct methods here. The first two use call data, and the second two use memory as their uh, parameters that are passed in. And the first and the third copy over the uh, parameter value into my value first and then increment my value, like so. And the second and the fourth just read straight from this call data. Um, well, they read straight from the parameter. It's call data in the second one and memory in the fourth one. You can see what they're doing there. Otherwise, I mean, there's no tricks going on here. The point in having these four different uh, methods that end up with the same result is to compare gas prices, the gas cost, the execution cost here. And I've commented out, uh, or I've put in a comment here, the gas price that I calculated when I ran these just before I started recording this video. So we can actually take a look at these for ourselves here in our um, Remix little interactive P 
piece over here. So this is how we pass in values here. We have to pass in a tuple. We can't pass in like a JSON struct or anything. It doesn't work like that. And I'm just going to call reset here. Let me drag this up real quick so we can see what's going on. So I'm going to reset this. And then I'm going to call set struct one. And we can see how much gas this cost. Six, seven, seven, nine, nine gas for this first one right here. Okay, let's reset it and set struct two. See how much gas that costs. Six, six, three, five, two. Okay, so that one is a little bit less expensive than this first one. And actually, it turns out this one is the least expensive of the functions. That's because call data is less expensive to use than memory. And here, we're not doing this copy here. But interestingly enough, we'll see that copying around memory is a little bit cheaper. So if we run uh, set struct three, oh, uh, sorry, reset and say set struct three, then we'll see that costs six seven four three zero, and this costs six seven seven nine nine. If we copy all the way out from call data, that looks to be a little bit more expensive than from memory. So that's a little interesting. And then we have this last one, set struct four. So we'll reset it, set and set struct four. See how much gas this costs. Six, six, nine, three, seven, right there. Perfect. All right. So that's just a little bit of a gas comparison. You can take a closer look at these numbers if you want later. Again, code is linked in the description. All right. So then one more restriction with the call data that I want to demonstrate here is this little function right here called it test because I'm good at coming up with names. As you can see by my value, <laughs> set struct, and test. I'm really great at coming up with names. Sorry. Um, but here, we're actually getting an error here because I'm trying to call set struct one, which if you recall, takes in a call data parameter. But I'm passing in a memory parameter right here. This complex struct here, that's initialized into memory. And so the compiler is not going to like that. It's going to say that we can't um, put memory into call data. Because remember, call data is this immutable, it's kind of like memory, but it's its own little thing, right? So let's see this error here. It says invalid type for argument in function call, invalid implicit conversion from a struct that's stored in memory to a struct that's stored in call data. So we can't convert from memory to call data. But obviously, uh, we can read stuff out of call data. So that is okay. And I'm just going to comment that back out because. Compiler doesn't like it. All right, so that pretty much covers call data, memory, and storage in Solidity. And now I want to talk about the alternative because you know you might actually have to use Solidity and deal with this. It's a little bit of a mess. The call data, the memory, the storage. It's not something that you see in other you know regular, more popular programming languages. That's because Solidity is what's called a domain-specific language, mean which means that it was created to fulfill a very specific purpose. And that very specific purpose is writing smart contracts on EVM uh, compatible blockchains. EVM is the Ethereum virtual machine. So Solidity is a domain specific language for writing smart contracts on EVM compatible uh, blockchains. And that means that there are some unique features to it that take a little bit of getting used to. But not all blockchains are this way. Some blockchains actually use general purpose programming languages for their, for their uh, smart contracts. <laughs> so uh, one of these is NIR. This is NIR. You can see it at NIR.org. And uh, full disclosure, I do do some contract work for NIR, which is why I'm more familiar with the NIR platform than maybe other platforms. But the NIR blockchain is unique because it uses smart contracts that have been written in WebAssembly. So it doesn't have its own custom domain specific programming language for writing smart contracts. Instead, you can use any general purpose programming language that compiles to WebAssembly because then they just instantiate a WebAssembly virtual machine and inject some globals that allow you to access and interact with the blockchain. And then they just run WebAssembly code that is the smart contract and take out the results. And there you go. That's that's how smart contracts work in, well, roughly how they work in the near ecosystem. And so there are these different programming languages that can compile to WebAssembly. And particularly, the two that the near ecosystem has focused on are 
Rust and assembly script. So Rust, you may have heard of before. I have some videos on this channel about writing a blockchain in Rust. Um, now we're writing smart contracts in Rust. But yeah, so Rust is a very popular programming language. It's like the most loved programming language on Stack Overflow for six years running. It's developed by Mozilla. So it's a really great language to learn, even if you're not planning on writing smart contracts in it, because it's really useful on, on like a systems programming level. So like C, C++. Anyways, Rust is a great programming language that you can write smart contracts for the near platform in. And the other one is assembly script, which is kind of a derivative or a dialect of TypeScript. And TypeScript, as you probably know, is a super, super set of JavaScript, and it adds strict typing to JavaScript. What that essentially means is if you are a web developer who is interested in the Web3 space, you can just hop over to Near and start writing smart contracts right away. Anyways, enough of that. Let's take a look at some actual smart contracts that run on Near. So we're just going to take a look at this one right here. This one is a very basic counter smart contract. This is written in assembly script. So it looks very, very similar to JavaScript. If you're only familiar with JavaScript and not TypeScript, these little bits right here, like here and here and here might be new to you. Those are just uh, type signatures. So this is telling us here that this value parameter is the type of an a signed 32-bit integer. So it can be negative or positive 32 bits. Um, this function doesn't return anything. And OK, so the reason that this is an advantage that it uses these uh, general purpose programming languages is that you don't have to learn this paradigm of storage or memory or call data. Instead, function parameters just work like regular old function parameters and then in the example of near here, we have an API for accessing storage instead of keywords. And um, you know, sometimes storage acts a little bit funky if you're copying around from one storage location to another storage location, or storage to memory, or call data to storage, or something like that. So it can you have to you know learn some new rules. But if you don't want to learn all the specifics of Solidity, you can just stick with what you're comfortable with, JavaScript, and interact with storage using this API. So we have this storage API from the near SDK that you can use to get a primitive. This is generically typed. So you're getting a, a signed 32-bit integer from this storage. And in the case of near, storage is just a key value store. So we're getting the storage location identified by counter. And this, is, I think, is a default, like a fallback value. So it'll return 0 if nothing else, if uh, the counter key doesn't exist in storage. And then we're adding value, which is our parameter here, to our counter value right here. And this is just a regular JavaScript variable or JavaScript constant, I guess. And then you interact with storage again by saying set. And we're, again, parameter type, uh, type parameter here with uh, a signed 32-bit integer. And we're setting that counter key equal to the new counter value. And then we use this logging API. And logging in near is kind of similar to how events work in Solidity, if you're familiar with that. And as you can see, this is just regular JavaScript code. You have a special storage API that you use to interact with storage instead of uh, different like storage, memory, and call data keywords. And it's just a like a push and or a put and get, I think is is like the paradigm here. So you can just get things from the key value store and set things in the key value store, like a hash map or or a dictionary or something like that. Fairly simple, fairly straightforward. So all of this stuff will be linked in the description. There are a bunch of near smart contract examples, both both in Rust and in assembly script that you can check out. I would highly recommend that you take a look at the near blockchain, maybe give it a try. If not, I thank you so much for watching this video. Regardless, I hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed it. I know I enjoy making these types of videos. So uh, good luck with writing your smart contracts out there and have a good one.